Good morning, everyone. We're just waiting a few seconds so everyone can connect to start the webinar. Okay, great. We see the number of participants increasing. Just a few more minutes. Okay, great. So good morning and welcome to this webinar on ending violence against women and girls with disability in the European Union. Uh, it is an event organized by the European Disability Forum in cooperation with uh, Inclusion Europe. My name is Marine Eldry and I'm EDF Human Rights Officer. So before we start today, I would like to share with you some logistical information and housekeeping rule for how the webinar will work. So all participants are on mute, but you can use the chat box for technical issues. And also during the Q&A, we'll be able to activate your microphone. So you'll be able to ask your question. Um, in case you have any technical issue, please really use the chat box and you can write directly to my colleague Raquel, who will help you. The webinar has interpretation in international and sign. And you can pin the interpreter so you have a better visibility of the interpretation. We also have live captioning that you can activate to Zoom. And there's also an external link in the chat box that you can use. Uh, we want to thank you already to thank very much our interpreter, Lisa and Gerdinand, and our live captioner, Kimberly. Useful documents will be posted in the chat box through the webinar, so you can also uh, have a look from time to time uh, in the chat box to download or access specific links. The webinar is recorded and will be available uh, afterwards, so we'll send, it, uh, send a link to all participants. The way the webinar will work is that we'll have like two panels with a 10 minute breaks in between at around 11.10. There will also be opportunities to ask questions or make comments after each panel. <clears throat> to ask questions, please use the Q&A box, not the child box, the Q&A uh, box. Please specify your name and organization. Or you can also use the anonym, anonymous option if you would like to your, your name not to, be, not to be known or mentioned. To make the event more interactive, we will give the floor to participants to send questions during the Q&A. So if you do not want to be given the floor orally, please tell us. And in that case, we will read the question for you. For person using sign language, please indicate um, that you will need your webcam to be turned on for the interpreter to, to be able to interpret. Um, please also specify to which speaker you would like to address your question. So that's it from my side for now. Um, and now without further ado, I will give the floor to Anna Pelaez, who is uh, EDF Vice Pre President and who will uh, open and moderate the webinar. Thank you, Anna, and thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Uh Uh, and work or it's important the vice president of the European Disability Forum uh, chair this uh, event here uh, from 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 Spain with the participation of many organizations uh, who are present here with us today. Uh, I would like also to start offering some information about how and why violence against women and girls with disabilities is really a key issue, an important issue in the agenda of the women with disabilities right. You know, the, following the information provided by UN Women and the Health World Organization, the uh, 19.2% of women are women with disabilities. The lower 
status of economical situation or social situation, the violence against women and the harmful practices against women provoke this high percentage of disability among the female population. When we look at the situation of the global uh, population of people with disability, we have to say that here in Europe, in the region, in the European Union, not only, but in the whole region, and region in, in Europe, the 60% of the population of people with disability are women or girls with disabilities. That means more or less uh, 60 million of citizens with uh, being uh, uh, women, girls, and having a disability. 60 million of citizens without any consideration in, in, in any uh, violence policy or, or the, in any uh, policy against violence uh, against women. Um, but when we are talking about 60 million of citizens, we need to think about a population uh, more or less the same as, for example, the population of Italy. Can you, uh, what would be the react of the society if a country such as uh, Italy is not considered in any policy? This is what is happening now in relation with the situation of women and girls with disabilities. And that is also very important in relation with uh, the violence against them. The aim of the, the webinar that we, we have today in front of us is, uh, first of all, to know exactly how is the situation, identifying forms of violence faced by women and girls with disabilities, perhaps also not only women and girls with disabilities, perhaps also um, the impact of violence against women uh, in relation with mothers uh, of children with disabilities, for example, which is also very important. The second issue here is to discuss with EU actors and partners, including, for example, the European Commission, the Council of Europe, the Women's Organization, the DPOs uh, also, how to work together to end violence against women and girls with disabilities. This is uh, what uh, our agenda, and this is what we need to, how we need to work today in this regard. To develop all these um, uh, objectives, uh, we are going to present two different panels. Panel with very uh, ex professional and expert people. The first one, the first panel, is going to identify forms of violence faced by women and girls with disabilities. And the second one is going to, to analyze and to, to discuss uh, about um, how to act in relation to end violence against women and girls with disabilities. So this is why I think uh, we need also to address the situation. And this is a very simple way to consider violence against women and girls with disabilities and mothers of children with disabilities also in our own organization. First, identify the situation. And second, to organize and to plan how to react um, and to combat this situation. So for me, um, it's a really uh, a pleasure to start this uh, webinar um, with uh, um, the, the participation of a woman. I don't know if the first speaker is already with us. I am looking for um, Senada, I don't know if, is she already connected? Um, um, Raquel or Marie? Hello. Hello, are you there? Yes. Ah, hello. Did hello. You, 
this is wonderful. Welcome to, to this webinar. So my first speaker, as I mentioned, is Senada Halievic. She is former chair of the European platform of Cell Advocate, and she's also vice president of uh, Inclusion Europe. It's a pleasure for all of us to have your Senada with us today. She will be also supported by, by uh, uh, Damian. So thank you also, Damian, for, for this support. And um, Senada is going to tell us about violence in institutions of women and girls with disabilities. Uh, Senada, very welcome to this uh, uh, first panel. And you have the floor for 15 minutes, Senada. Okay, um, hvala na pozivu. Samo bi rekla da je Damran tu s nama u uredu, ali u ovom će me pomoć asistentica Ana Marija. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Uh, Damian is here with us, uh, but uh, I will assist in the Senada to Ana Maria. Dobodan svima, moje ime je Senada Holevčević i dolazim iz udruge za samo zastupanje i bivša sam predsjednica Evropske platforme samo zastupnika. Hello everyone, my name is Senada Halilčević and I work in the Association for Self-Advocacy in Zagreb, Croatia. I'm the former president of a European platform of self-advocacy. Kanadžim čranomima već dugo razgovaramo o nasilju na tijelu. Uh, we talked about violence with our members for a very, a very long time. Uh, in 2015 and 2016, in cooperation with Inclusion Europe and six other organizations, we have studied more carefully violence of women with intellectual disabilities. Prema metodologiji koju je izradila gospođa Juti Hall i Inclusion Europe, a koju smo mi već prilagodili prevedni na hrvatski jezik, provali smo istrašivanje sa članicama naše udruge According to the methodology that was made by Ms. Yuki Hola and Inclusion Europe, we did a research with members of Association for Self-Advocacy. We adjusted and translated the methodology in Croatian. We interviewed 10 self-advocates in the research, and then one of them told us that they experienced different types of violence. Uh, Okay, 
A woman mentioned uh, physical violence, psychological violence, economic violence, sexual violence, disrespect for privacy, and taking away the freedom of movement. We have noticed that some of our members could not recognize all types of violence clearly. Some of the members didn't recognize that denying the freedom of movement or opening their private mail was actually a violence. Although emphasis of our research was violence that women experience in institutions, we have established that violence was happening everywhere. In institutions, in families, in foster families, and in community living support services. The biggest problems that we recognize in violence on women with intellectual disabilities in Croatia are the first one is lack of support for victims of violence and the lack of necessary information. Many self-advocates cannot recognize violence and cannot or don't know how to report violence by themselves. Uh, the second one uh, was lack of trust towards people with intellectual disabilities. Even when self-advocates were trying to complain and seek protection from abuse, they had an impression that no one believed them. They thought that everyone believed the person who abused them, but not them. Uh. All this has a very bad effect on women with intellectual disabilities who often remain exposed to violence for a very long time. So, 
Therefore, we believe it would be very useful when there would be the legal obligation of, to provide necessary information and when the position of social service users uh, would be strengthened. Uh, service provider and user are not equal, especially when the user is deprived of full capacity, when it's the person with intellectual disability and when it's a woman. Ono što je poprilično tmurno zaključak našeg istraživanja je da ona toč svim do sad usvojenim zakonima i mjerima, mjerama sigurnost i zaštite žena za intelektualnim teškoćama od Nasilja i dalje najviše ovisi o tuđoj dobroj voli i humanost, a to ne bi trebalo biti tako. It is said to conclude that despite all laws and measures adopted so far, the safety and protection of women with intellectual disabilities from violence most depends on to someone else's goodwill and humanity, and that should not be so. Uh, thank you for attention. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for your intervention. You are a really inspiration for many women, especially with the most intensive uh, disabilities and need of support. Thank you very much because with your with your example, you can also uh, motivate the participation on other women with intellectual disabilities, psychosocial disabilities, deaf blindness, for example, which is fundamental. And also congratulations to Inclusion Europe for supporting the participation of self-advocate women in your network. So really congratulations. And as you mentioned, perhaps later we can have more uh, or some question or reflection about your intervention. A very important also issue, violence in institutions, especially for women and girls with disabilities. So thank you very much. So now we go to my country, to Spain and my organization, Semi Women Foundation, to share with you the um, important um, at that uh, important um, result in relation with the forced sterilization in our legal system in Spain. And to present this situation, I would like to give now the floor to my colleague Isabel Caballero, who is the coordinator of CERMI Women's Foundation. Isabel, welcome to this webinar organized by the European Disability Forum. Thank you very much for your presence today here. Hello, good morning, Anna. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, for taking into consideration the work of Thermi Women's Foundation in defending the human rights of women and girls with disabilities. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce my organization. Uh, Thermi Women's Foundation is a Spanish uh, non-profit organization uh, created in uh, 2014 by the Spanish Committee of Representatives of Persons with Disabilities, uh, Thermi to advocate for the full exercise of all human rights and fundamental liberties by women and girls with disabilities, a population of two and a half million citizens. 
Thermi Women's Foundation takes as its main reference the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and of course, the Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against uh, Women and Domestic Violence of the Council of Europe. In my speech, I will deal with the issue of forced sterilization in Spain, how it's regulated in our penal code, and how uh, Thermi uh, Women's Foundation has contributed to the eradication of forced sterilization in my country. Well, the legal regulation of this matter is included in the Spanish Penal Code, as I have said uh, before, uh, where the legal authorization of forced sterilization is provided for as a, a safeguard. But the problem lies uh, with the fact that incapacitation continues to exist as a legal institution. Um, Article 156 of the current Penal Code states that, and I'm going uh, to read it uh, literally, a sterilization agreed by a judicial body in the case of persons who are permanently unable to give the consent will not be subject to punishment, provided it's an exceptional case where there is a grave clash of legally protected assets with the aim of safeguarding the greater interest of the affected person and according to the provisions of the civil legislation. So the procedure regulated in this article provides that sterilization must be authorized by a judge in the procedure of modifying the legal capacity or in a latter contradictory procedure. So we can affirm that the current, current Spanish uh, penal code still allows forced sterilization to be performed on persons with disabilities and has become a practice with a clear uh, gender bias, as it's mostly practiced on women. Uh, submitting to this mutilating practice without the consent of the woman involved uh, breaches uh, different articles of the CRPD, for example, Article uh, 17 or Article uh, 23. Uh, the precondition of the prior modification of the legal capacity of the individual in these cases uh, raises particular concerns as it means a further obstacles of these women uh, when accessing justice uh, to defend their rights uh, when they are victims of violence, for example, because they have to use an intermediary a person, uh, a tutor, uh, who may also be the person who is perpetrating the acts of violence. Uh, to gain a deeper understanding of the issue, uh, Thermi Women's Foundation has condemned this practice contrary to human rights uh, treaties. So in uh, uh, 2017, uh, Thermi Women's Foundation published a study titled um, Putting an End to the Forced Sterilization of Women and Girls with Disabilities, uh, which reveals that one of the existing problems is the lack of transparency a violation of international conventions on, on human rights. Existing data, according to the General Council of the Judiciary in, in Spain, show that the total number of resolved cases amounted 140 in 2016. And there is no way of knowing the final resolution in each case or the impact on women and men, as the data are not disaggregated by sex. Uh, the information uh, received by the competent organization uh, show that this practice affects uh, mostly women. The annual average is close to uh, 100 authorizations of, uh, for sterilization or, or the use of uh, contraceptives uh, without informing the individual or even against uh, his or her will. Uh, this lack of data uh, shows a lack of compliance uh, with the recommendations made by the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons uh, with Disabilities to the Spanish state in 2011 and in 2019. Um, in addition, uh, these recommendations arch the development of policies aimed at compensating people with disabilities, and especially women and girls, who have been sterilized. Uh, putting measures in place to train women with disabilities on their sexual and reproductive rights 
and repealing the laws allowing uh, for the practice of forced sterilization. So uh, what has Thermi Women's Foundation done in this context? Well, for us, it's urgent to develop uh, training programs aimed at all stakeholders, and especially including the most immediate uh, social circle uh, closest to women with disabilities. And uh, we are working on this issue precisely now. In fact, at the beginning of the 2021, we will begin to implement a state project uh, focused on training in sexual and reproductive rights for women and girls with disabilities. Um, it is important to highlight the work that the Women's Foundation has developed focused on raising awareness about this, the need to end forced sterilization. Um, I have previously made reference to a publication edited by our entity together with the EDF, but here I also have to refer uh, the work of uh, raising awareness uh, carried out by Thermi Women's Foundation among women's organization in Spain, as well uh, as among public bodies specialized in gender violence. Um, an idea setting to carry out this work was uh, the working groups that were created in 2017 to draft the measures of the future state pact against uh, gender violence in which uh, representatives of feminist organization and public bodies specialized in this matter participated. In this context, an interesting debate uh, took place related to the conceptualization of gender violence. Uh, at this point, I have to explain that uh, the Spanish law uh, recognizes a very restrictive, restrictive uh, definition of gender violence, limited to violent, violence exerted by man against his female partner or former partner. Uh, this law does not refer to other forms of violence, uh, such as uh, sexual violence uh, or female uh, genital mutilation or forced sterilization. It's a law that responds only to a very specific form of violence against women. Those, works, uh, those work meetings to prepare the state pact, pact against gender violence uh, were very interesting because they allowed us as a social organization to present to a large audience our demands focused on the elimination of forced sterilization, a very uh, unknown issue, issue for the feminist movement in Spain and also to remember the obligation of the Spanish state uh, to comply with the St Istanbul Convention. In fact, many of these women's organizations didn't know that the Istanbul Convention prohibits forced sterilization in its Article 39. In some way, our speeches in this working meeting served, as I have uh, already pointed uh, out before, to raise awareness about an issue that was not included in the political agenda of the feminist movement. It was even seen as an issue that was not part of the feminist demands. In this sense, uh, there is a certain social consensus in my country in considering sterilizations of women and girls with disabilities as a protection measure and not as a blatant violation of human rights. And uh, we- One minute, uh, Isabel. Yes, we clearly perceive this consensus, for example, when we, uh, every time uh, we demonstrate in the streets, no? In fact, there are people who approach us in those demonstrations uh, to remind us that, uh, uh, that what we are demanding is not part of the feminist agenda and implies the elimination of a measure of protection. Uh, despite this misunderstanding and ignore, ignorance, uh, we have continued to participate in demonstrations, organizing conferences and workshops uh, focused on the demands of the elimination of forced sterilization. And these actions have already uh, served to undermine uh, those preconceptions shared by much of society about the sterilization. And this work has also been done with the families of women and girls with disabilities. Okay, so thank you, thank you so much, uh, Isabel, for this great contribution here to the discussion today. Uh, I think harmful practice, practices against women and girls with disabilities is a fundamental issue in relation with violence against them. And this is why also I would like to share with you that the EDF has already, in collaboration with Selmy Women Foundation, a publication 
in this regard, so perhaps we can share the link with this uh, publication in the in the chat. And also, I would like to offer another important tool here, which is the um, uh, joint general recommendation uh, offered by the um, the CEDO committee and the CRC committee. Is the uh, general recommendation number thirty one for the CEDO and general comment uh, number 18 for the CRC on harmful practices. And uh, where, for example, forced abortion, forced sterilization, uh, genital mutilation, etc., are considered in this regard. And it's very important to take in mind also the, the, um, uh, this uh, important uh, instrument. So, now we go to thank you very much uh, once again, Isabel, for your contribution. Now we go to France um, to talk about the domestic violence, sexual harassment, and access to services for victims um, uh, who are women and girls with disabilities. So, in this regard, we have uh, today here with us uh, Claire Desson. Uh, Claire Desson uh, is the, the core president of Femme pour le dire, Femme pour agir, uh, one of the very little organization of women with disabilities in Europe. So it's a really pleasure to receive and to welcome today here with us uh, a Claire. Uh, bonjour Claire. Tu es là? Claire? Do you hear me? Oui. Yes, okay. we can okay. hear you. So, okay. you so, have the floor. so I am co-president of Femme pour le dire, Femme pour agir, which is an organization to promote uh, women with disabilities in the city. And, and we, we fight against violence against women and girls with disabilities. So I am going to speak about domestic violence and access to services for women with disabilities. Please, can you put the next slide? So domestic violence covers a variety of forms of violence that occur within the family unit, current or former spouses and partners, and it's in its broader sense, domestic violence also involves violence against children, parents, or the elderly. It takes a number of forms, including physical, verbal, emotional, economic, reproductive, and sexual abuse, which can range from subtle coercive forms to marital rape and to violent physical abuse. Domestic murders include stoning, bright burning, honor killings, and dowry deaths. The Istanbul Convention defines it as all acts of physical, sexual, psychological, or economic violence that occur within the family or domestic unit or between former or current spouses or partners, whether or not the perpetrator shares or has shared the same residence with the victim. So that is a very broad uh, definition. Club, yes, please, the next one. Disability specific, there is a specific violence for girls and women with disabilities. Victims of domestic violence are overwhelmingly women, but for women and girls with disabilities, the, it includes forms of violence faced by all women and girls, but there are specific violence for women with disabilities. They, are, they, have, they need high support and so they are more at risk, such as restraint, removal or control of communication aids, of means of payment as credit card, use of a physical power, sexual abuse during daily hygiene routines, violence in the course of treatment, over medication or withholding medication. There is a vast, vast uh, means of violence. In the European Union, there is a lack of data on domestic violence faced by women and girls 
with disabilities in the EU. In a report of 2007, it is a figure of nearly 80%, which shows that women with disability are to a large amount victims of psychological and physical violence. Research available now show that 34% of women with a health problem or a disability have experienced physical or sexual violence by a partner in their lifetime. It is twice to five times more than women without disability. This number is certainly underreported, as we know that many women and girls with disabilities are not reporting violence due to a variety of reasons I will mention later on. I give you the link to find the, the report of, uh, Europe, of Europe on uh, the, the figure of nearly 80%. In France, data are not available. Even in the last survey called Virage, we asked to have a, a criterion with disability, but there was only one question asking for the health status. And they did not go into institutions, which is a place where there are a lot of violence. Aware of the extension of this violence, our association opened in March 2015, Écoute Violence Femmes Handicapées. It is the first helpline in France to provide legal, social, and psychological support to disabled women <coughs> who are victims of violence or abuse. The hotlines are run by volunteers trained in the specifics of violence against women with disability. In 2015, we produced a film of eight video clips directed by Catherine Cabrol, which highlights eight testimonies of women with various disabilities, victims of violence. And through our hotline, we receive a lot of testimonies about violence. For example, a husband pushing his wife in a wheelchair into a sloping street, slapping in the face, a husband and son doing hair pulling, strangling, telling they are going to kill her, a woman deprived of food to be lighter when her father or brothers carry her, her husband doing what he wants in sexual life. Next uh, slide, please. Well, this is the, the data of our hotline in 2019. We had 1,093 calls and a lot of uh, meetings with a, a lawyer, with a psychologist, with some, uh, someone to, to help for lodging or work. Next uh, slide, please. Qualitative data from the hotline show that 30, uh, 35% of reported violence occurs within the couple and is committed by the spouse. 15% by parents, 60% takes place in the victim's home, Psychological abuse is for 71% and physical violence, 45%. So now we, we are tomorrow, we will launch a new website specifically on violence against women and girls with disabilities through a video conference. And this site is intended to promote the actions of the association, but also to be a resource center on the issue of violence against disabled women and girls. So you could uh, send us articles to be put on this site. Next one. In France, we had a big forum last year, which was called the Grenelle. It, is a, it was a very big forum on the fight against domestic violence. 12 steering groups were created and one group was dedicated to violence against women and girls with disabilities. Three measures have been adopted on November 2019. In each region, there will be a resource center to support women with disabilities in their intimate and sexual life and their parenting. We, we are going to, to, to do um, information to remind all institutions and medical and social services of the need to respect privacy and sexual and reproductive rights 
of a company woman and third to launch a certified online training program to massively increase the skills of the various professionals who work in medical and social establishments and services. Next one. The, 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 the French Senate wrote a report in 2019. We had been uh, uh, met with the Senate. And uh, in January, the Senate unanimously adopted a resolution to denounce an act against violence against women with disabilities. It provides important recommendations, the need of data, financial autonomy, and effort to train professionals in the specificity of sexual violence committed against women with disabilities, extended to all potential stakeholders, the accessibility of refugees. Next one. Now, there was a big impact of COVID-19 and lockdowns on domestic violence. We know in France that domestic violence has in intensified with the lockdown about 30, 32% more, it has increased by 32% for all women. And women and girls with disability, especially those with health issues and or high support needs, were obliged to stay at home, often for a longer time, and no more nurses or medical carers coming home, no visits from outside as friends, and were isolated. And a lot of them had to rely on their abuser for support. So the violence has increased. Claire, one minute. What? One minute, please. One minute. So the French uh, government did uh, uh, an extended campaign to so that women could report violence. And there was also a certificate specifically for uh, people with disabilities so that they could go out more and further. Next slide. So that was the, but we, we saw in a hotline that calls were uh, diminished during the, the lockdown, maybe because they were afraid of their partner who was uh, in the same uh, place as them. But after the lockdown, there was a big, a big increase of calls. Next. Uh, so now I will tell you rapidly the causes of underreporting, lack of. Uh, sorry, sorry, Claire. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough time now, okay. but perhaps later with the discussion with uh, the, the participants, uh, you can offer more information. Okay, okay. so. And, and I think the participants will have the presentation. Sorry? I think that this, the presentation will be given to the participants. participants. So that can, yes. This is okay. great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire, for for this wonderful information um, about your experience in, in France in relation with victims of violence with disabilities. So now we go to another important issue, which is uh, the sexual harassment harassment concept, and also linking with disabilities in uh, for for consider this situation, this uh, new approach also in relation with violence against women and girls with disabilities, we have Katarzyna um, Seglicka, uh, Autonomy Foundation Article 6 Collective. And also we have Anies Kakrol um, coming from um, Jagiel, sorry, Jagiellonian uh, University Medical College, perhaps it's not <laughs> the first, uh, the best pronunci pronunciation. Sorry about that. So both of you, thank you very much for coming and to join us. You have both of you together twelve minutes. Please, you have the floor, Katarzyna. Yes, hello, hello everyone. Kasia, are you here also? Is this Kasia? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Hello, hello. So good morning, uh, everyone. 
uh, we will be tackling sexual harassment and disability uh, and the complex realities women with disabilities face when navigating consent in an ableist and patriarchal world. And we will share our presentation in two parts. Um, the first one will be presented by me and the, uh, the second part will be presented by Katarzyna Żeglicka. And we are both, uh, and they are both informed by our work in feminist disability uh, rights uh, groups and, uh, and are located in Poland, a country where the government announced uh, that they aim to withdraw from Istanbul uh, Convention. So uh, I, I'll start and then I give the floor to, uh, to Katarzyna. So when uh, speaking about sexual harassment against women with disabilities, what is striking, uh, we think is the discrepancy between the prevalence of violence in women experiences and the silence on this topic in public space and social policies. So um, uh, I was doing a PhD research on reproductive justice and experiences of women with disabilities. And even though I did not focus on, uh, on, uh, on violence itself, it became, it became a central topic due to the ubiquity and drasticity of stories uh, I have heard. Yet uh, such cases are usually presented in media as isolated ones, uh, which hinders, in fact, understanding of structural power relations that, uh, that shape those experiences. So why it is so crucial that uh, women's voice against rape, rape culture is very loud and amplified with Me Too movement, we still think that perspective of women with disabilities uh, on sexual violence is not visible uh, enough. And this is despite the fact that, that persistence of violence and inadequacy of social policies have consequences for women regardless uh, of their uh, abilities. And uh, it is also manifested, of course, in statistical research that intersection of patriarchal and ableist structures lead to higher prevalence of sexual violence in, dis in disabled women. Thus, we have uh, welcomed very much the recent publication by, by EU women, uh, U sorry, uh, UN women uh, on sexual harassment, uh, and also the joint statement by UN women and CEDAW and CRPD committees on ending sexual harassment again women and girls uh, with disabilities uh, that recognize that sexual harassment uh, is a human rights violation of gender equality principles and is intersecting with other dimensions of uh, inequality, such as uh, those related to disability. And it involves unwelcome sexual conduct from looks to words, to touching, to um, interfering with assistive devices, to physical contact uh, and uh, sexual assault and rape. And we should pay attention uh, also uh, to the homophobic and transphobic violence uh, that is present. And especially it was very vocal, unfortunately, in Poland in recent uh, months and is also experienced by persons with disabilities who are not cisgender or uh, non-heterosexual. And uh, when talking about uh, sexual harassment and disability, we need to remember that speaking about consent and bodily autonomy for persons with disabilities uh, means uh, tackling also when and how yes or no expressed by uh, disabled women is being taken seriously. So it starts with non-consensual -consen touch by strangers, of course, and speaks also to the legal capacity and how it shapes broader discourses on, uh, on disabled women. And moreover, uh, we need to highlight that women uh, with disabilities experience sexual violence from people providing everyday support and assistance. So in the research that I have done, it was uh, mostly uh, partners, husbands, father, uh, carer, and accessibility providers. Uh, it was uh, happening at home, in the campus, uh, in the religious communities, as well as rehabilitation centers and, uh, of course, institutions. And also when women uh, were seeking uh, justice, they encounter, of course, many accessibility barriers, but also assumptions about their, the sexuality of people with disabilities. So still, uh, this assumption that people with disabilities are not sexual beings made, makes it truly difficult for disabled women to address sexual harassment, as the discourses um, uh, countering uh, believing women get even stronger. They undermine their credibility and sustain beliefs that they are unreliable witness uh, when seeking justice. But on the other hand, uh, we, uh, we also observe that some parents are trying to save their daughters with disabilities from sexual violence 
by preventing them from participating fully in the community, thus hindering their independent living. So uh, what we notice is that, that the structure of failure to prevent violence, uh, to prevent sexual violence is connected with the enjoyment of independent uh, living by all uh, women. And uh, um, my last point would be also that to understand that it is crucial to uh, understand to whom women share, with whom women share the, uh, their experiences of sexual violence. And in my research, it was basically women sharing their experiences within their friendship networks, uh, which, of, which of course not all women uh, had access to. But uh, in fact, um, um, uh, when we look at, at the effectiveness of informing uh, about sexual uh, violence in their community, I have to say that among all the participants of the research, no offender bird any consequences. Only two women among 15 of them decided to take the case to the court. And um, first was time bird and the second just didn't find enough uh, uh, enough proof. So I'll stop here and uh, give the floor to Katarzyna Żeglicka. So Kasia, jeżeli chcesz, to teraz ty możesz wejść. Hello. I am a woman with disability. I'm an, I am also a Vendo trainer. Vendo is a feminist self-defense and assertiveness training for women and girls. I teach women uh, with disabilities how to recognize violence and react to it. From my meetings with women with disabilities, I can tell that we have a collective uh, experience of physical, psychological, economical, and sexual violence. We are touched without our, our consent. We are treated uh, as children. Uh, it is assumed uh, we do not have sexual desire, but we experience sexual harassment and violence. Most of the, uh, most of the offenders are not punished. Society teaches uh, us to be silent. When we are in danger, we are afraid to scream. In a meeting with women with intellectual disabilities, uh, uh, we were talking about what to do when someone touches with us without consen consent on the bus. One option is to scream. It, it, this will bring attention uh, of the passenger. After the meeting, one carer came to me. She said, do not teach them to scream because people will think they are mentally ill. In Poland, we do not get sexual education. We are not taught body awareness. Often we do not know when and how to set uh, boundaries and do, uh, when behavior is violence or cons uh, harassment. In the consent workshop, workshop that I led, uh, a blind couple participated. They have been together for some years. They told me they do not know what is sex and what uh, is allowed to intimate relations. They do not know how to speak about their own needs. They do not know each other's bodies. Women with disabilities complain that others touch their wheelchairs and their white, white sticks without permis permission. Therefore, they learn how to use these uh, devices for self-defense. The cr crutches uh, uh, or the wheelchair become their self defense tool. From January 2020, the Autonomy uh, uh, Foundation, a Garance, an organization from Belgium, France, and Germany, have been carrying out a project for women with disabilities, no means no. We organize uh, we, uh, empowerment workshops. We also collect their success story. They tell uh, us 
how they react to violence. The success story will be included uh, in the guide. The aim of the guide is to help other women with disability learn how to react and uh, recall their own stories. In my experience, it is very important for trainers and uh, women with disabilities to share their experience, support each other, and learn to recognize and respond to violence. Finally, I would like to stress that we must remember that most of the work must be done by men. They are 95% uh, for uh, the offenders. There are also men with disabilities among them. Violence prevention means educating men and men should take responsibility for changing harmful uh, assumptions uh, around sexual violence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all, both of you, Aniska and Katarzyna, for your wonderful reflection and information provide. I would like also to ask my colleague to offer in the for participants the joint statement by UN Women, the CEDO Committee, and the CRPD Committee on Ending Sexual Harassment Against Women and Girls with Disabilities, which is an uh, important tool in relation with this topic, sexual harassment against them, women and girls with disabilities. So now we have a little time for participants. So I would like to pass the, the floor to Marine. Um, to know who were asking for the floor or perhaps sharing some reflection in the chat. Marine, uh, can you please tell us about the, the, our participants today? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. So just to mention that all the document, all the links to the document were posted in the chat. So Wonderful. to all participants, please check the check the chat to have the, the information. So we received a few questions. Uh, maybe I can already tell you three of them, and then they can be addressed by by speakers. So the or oh, uh, perhaps uh, do we have a, someone asking for the floor directly? I would like to hear some voices, so me perhaps check. from participants. So we have a question from. Eliona. So Eliona, if you want to take the floor um, early, it's possible. Eliona, hello. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, thank you very much for the floor and thank you to all the presenters for, for such a great insights. Uh, my question is, well, first of all, I am a PhD um, studying violence against women in Iceland and UK in relation to access to justice mm -hmm. um, for those women subjected to violence, of course. Mm -hmm. And my question was, you all told about what is happening and there's plenty of research to back this up. And my question is, okay, violence, it is happening. So what are these NGOs that presented today doing about um, enabling or supporting women to access justice in terms of uh, reporting, investigating or prosecuting okay. um, the violence? Very good, very Thank good you. question. Thank you very much. We are going to take some more questions. Uh, who is the next, Marine? So we have two questions, but they're anonymous, so I can read them. Okay, please. Uh, one question is uh, to uh, on the situation in Pal Poland and whether the movement of persons with disability is aware of intersectionality as a concept. Mm -hmm. And the second one is more addressed to Claire, so I think of domestic violence, and it's whether we have information on difference in the violence between lesbian couples and mm -hmm. heterosexual couples. So whether violence is more um, perpetrated by, by men towards uh, women. Okay. okay, so we have three questions. I would like to share three these three questions with the, the different speakers. So. Perhaps for access to justice, uh, Isabel, could you please uh, answer the, the question made by our colleague from UK? 
Yes, well, from Thermi Women's uh, Foundation, we are working very actively with the different parliamentary groups in order uh, to remove the incapacitation system in our country, because this, this, this is the first obstacle that women with disabilities uh, has to face uh, in the access to justice. On the other hand, we are also uh, very, we are involved in the implementation of the measures of the uh, state pact uh, uh, of uh, against uh, gender violence, uh, which uh, recognize uh, very important measures uh, related to uh, the um, configuration, a new figure of uh, support of women uh, with disabilities when they have to access to justice. Perhaps they have, uh, uh, they need a, a specific support. Uh, to understand uh, the different uh, steps in, in, in the judge or in, in, in the trials or if they need a, a specific or accessible information regarding the, the laws and the services uh, available for victims of violence. Um, that's uh, the main uh, work that we are doing in, in, in our organization. Uh -huh. uh, Claire, do you have in your organization, through your information, uh, any difference uh, between the partners, uh, lesbian partners and um, heteros heterosexual partners in relation with domestic violence? Uh, do you have any um, distinction, for example, in the numbers of um, your complaints or situations? Uh, well, no, I don't think we have, but maybe I, I can ask uh, the, the, the administration, because maybe they have got some, some uh, data, but I don't think we have a lot. A lot. Okay, well, but, so... Okay, I would will, I will like to, to answer to Eliona too. Uh, okay. With, with our organization, we train, we train police and uh, judge and judges on the women with disabilities so that they uh -huh. can be, they can uh, know more what's what uh, it is for a woman with disability to uh, file a complaint and also to to answer to them and to be uh, to be quite uh, benevolent so we we do training for police uh -huh. and judge and judges and advocates and lawyers Okay, uh, thank you very much also for this contribution in relation with access to justice, which is really fundamental. So um, in relation with the previous questions, so we, we are going to try to, to, um, to um, collect the information and perhaps to offer this information to our uh, participants a little yes. later or perhaps through emails. Uh, if you yes. give us your email address, we can also answer your question by um, uh, read, uh, writing. So um, our last question is for our colleagues, uh, Kat, uh, Katarzyna and Anieska, in relation with uh, how is the situation for or the comprehension of intersectionality in, in, in Poland for, for women, uh, women with disabilities more um, specifically? So could you please answer the question? Yes, thank you for the question. Maybe I will translate what, uh, what Kasia answers. Uh, Kasia, jakbyś odpowiedziała na to pytanie dotyczące interseccjonalności, czy ona jest znanym konceptem w ruchu na rzecz osób niepełnosprawnych w Polsce? No, odpowiedz ty, ja odpowiem na drugie pytanie, dobra? Nie, to jest tylko jedno dla nas zaadresowane, więc, więc możesz powiedzieć, co myślisz. Eee, nie wiem, spróbuj to odpowiedzieć, bo ja się tak stresuję, że mi się wydaje, że nie jest za bardzo znana ta e, koncepcja. Że, tak, że bardziej jest rozpoznawalna teraz i badana przez, e, przez akademię, przez, na przykład przez ciebie, no to nie wiem. So Kasia is, Kasia is saying that the, the very concept of intersectionality is not really well addressed in the mainstream disability rights movement in Poland. Though what we observe is that uh, it is more and more well known, but it's not like really structurally addressed as it should uh, as it should be. But we observe that also in the academia, people are more and more using this concept also with regards to women uh, with disabilities, but but not only. But we would uh, we would wish that it's more addressed in the mainstream disability rights movement. 
Okay, so thank you, thank you very much also for this answer and for your support in the translation. Thank you so much. So now it's time for break for 10 minutes. Please don't uh, leave us uh, still connected. And in 10 minutes, we'll come back to continue with our second panel. I don't know if, Marine, do you want to say something? Thank you, Anna. So now we have 10 minutes. Just for all the panelists, please uh, stay on mute because the webinar won't be stopped. So participants are still able to hear you and see you. And if you have any question, please write directly to, to us in, in the chat box. And I'll see you in, uh, in 10 minutes. OK, wonderful. So um, enjoy your break. It's time to start again. Uh, once again, a very warm welcome to all the uh, speakers and participants. Now we are going to, to go to our second panel, uh, acting to end violence against women and girls with disabilities. And um, to, to start this panel, we are going to focus on talking to women in institutions who exper um, experience violence. And uh, for, for this important issue, we have Julti uh, Hola. She's an independent consultant for Life After Violence Project uh, with Inclusion Europe. So um, please, you, Julti, uh, you have the, the floor. I don't know if your name is my pronunciation yes, okay? <laughs> yeah, my... How do you pronounce your name? My name is Yulcha, or you. A Yulcha. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for being here today with us. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. Um, Inclusion Europe asked me to do a research about life after violence and violence in institutions. Um, and of course, institution is a very broad term institutions, we, we thought about residential care facilities where the residents are, are more or less isolated from the broader community um, and where they do not have sufficient control over their own lives uh, and over decisions that affect them. So that can be a very big institution, but you could even have an institution with um, just one person if you do not have any control over, over your life. Um, the research, the, the first step I took when doing this, this research was to speak to self-advocates because um, I'm not the one to decide what violence is or what is what what is experienced as violence in institutions as I've never lived in an institution. Um, and also I included them or I asked them, how should we talk about violence? What is a good way to discuss this really difficult topic with, with everyone? Um, also because people told me not to talk about violence because it would damage people, for instance. So I realized that was a difficult topic and uh, self-advocates were going to help me to discuss it in a, in a good way. Um, we um, created pictures together. So that's one way that they told me that we could talk about violence. And uh, we created pictures with red borders, which is the color of violence. Um, and um, each picture depicts a, a different type of violence. So we had many different pictures on the left, you'll see physical violence, for instance, the person with the blue eye, um, but there's, there's many different types of violence. And these pictures are not the, the be all or end all of all, you know, this is not the only violence that there is, but these are the, the types we heard most often and we drew them really just to start the conversation. So there's, there's the physical violence, sexual violence, uh, not getting care or medication, getting all the, the lousy jobs, um, not being able to speak up for yourself, uh, getting medication even though you don't want to get medication, um, being physically locked up or locked up by, by rules of an organization. There's, there's so many different forms. And we use these pictures, we would put them on a table and use them to start a discussion and just basically ask, okay, what, what do you see in these pictures? Um, and have you, have you, have, do you have any of these experiences? So um, we also use these in, in different countries. So we first tested them in the Netherlands 
but then we went to different countries. And for instance, on the right of your screen, you see two pictures of one of a woman showering um, and not getting the privacy. So someone just coming in and also from Romania. Um, that was something that came from Romania and everybody agreed that people were getting presents, but then once the cameras left, the presents were being taken away again. And that resonated with all the women we spoke to there. So there's so many different types of violence and these really helped us to just to discuss these. Um, uh, can you go to the next slide? Um, what we would do is we, everything we did was using pictures and everything we did was together with self-advocates. So um, self-advocates, they are the ones really to lead this discussion. They're the ones that can talk about it. So uh, I would be there as a support, but not as uh, the discussion leader, for instance. And that really helped to get the, the discussion going. What we did also to, to be able to include everyone is that we made case studies of the, the types of violence and the, the stories that we heard most. So, and the case studies were not just uh, black text on a white sheet because that again, excludes people. They were drawings um, like uh, comic strips, even though there isn't very, very much comical about them, I'm afraid. Um, this story is that you see now is uh, about um, really, constantly getting told, if you do something wrong, I'm going to send you to a psychologist. And um, so if you if you get angry, I will send you to a psychologist. If you don't cal calm down, I'll send you to a psychologist. But when something really happened and she was sent to a psychologist, that was you know the right thing to do. But um, because of all the threats really earlier on, she was not able to go to that psychologist and not see him as a, a punishment. So, um, we use these kind of drawings also, again, to discuss situations and to discuss situations also with people working in care. Can you go to the next one? Next slide. Yeah. Um, again, this is one of those uh, case studies where, oh, yeah, that's fine too. <laughs> um, this is where rules are making life hard. Uh, these both, <laughs> thank you, Marina. Um, rules are making life hard. There are so many rules, and in this case, it really, you know, it, it makes such an impact on someone that they start behaving behaving violently. And this person was telling us that she would be um, held down by by three or four men at the same time, undressed. She would get different clothes on, and then she would be locked in isolation. But that to her was no different from being sexually abused, which she had also experienced because they were, they were men, they were undressing her against her will. So for her, you know, for the, for the care system, this was a good way of reacting. But for her, this was, this was violence and this was very traumatic. There was really no different. Um, I think we'll skip the next picture because I don't have that much time. Um, yep, go. Oh, go to the next one again. I'm <laughs> sorry. I think I only have two minutes left. Um, there's so we, we created all these these pictures. Um, can you go to the next one, Marina? We we created all these pictures really to to talk about violence with women with intellectual disabilities, and we also went to different countries and adapted them a little bit. What we saw in the research was that there is a lot of direct violence. So under direct violence, we would uh, have um, physical or sexual abuse, for instance. But underneath that is a lot of structural violence. Uh, so we're talking about intersectionality earlier on, where um, people have, yeah, just a, a, a different um, place in society, which uh, you know opens them up to to various kinds of violence. And the structural violence is a very big issue and underneath all of the, the direct violence people are experiencing. And also the lack of having people that actually care about you and actually listen to you. That was a huge problem. Um, the picture you're seeing now is a, is a summary of, of part of the, the research. So it talks about that direct violence, about structural violence and about all the uh, result, what that results in. So people have experienced a lot, a lot of trauma um, there were a few changes. Uh, people think they're not enough. They're not good enough. Uh, they don't. They're not allowed to have anything good. 
but also they have a lot of coping strategies like not making contact just to avoid the pain or just staying quiet or being happy all the time. Um, and once they leave an institution, they bring all of that with them and they really need the right help and somebody who really cares about them to, you know, to sort this all out and to, to get better from the experiences they have had. Um, but the, the main point is always working with self-advocates and make, finding ways to make the, the conversation um, appropriate for them and so that they can really tell their stories. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this important um, intervention with these important pictures. I think it's, uh, it's really fundamental to, to show how is the situation for individuals, in, in this case, women and girls with disabilities in, in institutions. So I congratulate you and also uh, Inclusion Europe you. for this important initiative. Thank I have you forgotten so one thing. I, um, all, yes. the, all the materials are available from Inclusion Europe, and I think Helen has put the link in the description. Um, Please. All the materials can be used by other people as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, uh, <laughs> <you>. Sorry, <laughs> Georgia. Yes, no thank problem. you very much. So now yep. we, we need to know uh, uh, the role of the European Union uh, in ending violence against women and girls with disabilities. And uh, for this important issue, we have with us um, Lesia Radeliki, a member of the cabinet of Commissioner Dali from the European Commission. Um, I don't know, I'm sure you are already there. Lesia, are you there? Yes. yes, I'm here. Oh, wonderful. Welcome to this important um, webinar. Thank you for your contributions. So you have the floor. Thank you. And uh, thank you for, for uh, IDEA for, for giving me the floor. But I also would like to thank uh, the previous speaker, Yulcha, for, for making actually uh, an issue uh, accessible in discussing it. Because I think that that is one of the issues as well, that we need to bring uh, that that discussion to the table and, and, and mainstream it, bring it to not just to closed circles that work on these issues, but to widen it uh, so that we understand what violence is. And that I think that your pictures have, have touched upon the fact that indeed violence against women and girls and women and girls with disabilities take so many forms and they need to be recognized. And, before going into what the European uh, Commission is doing to combat violence against women and girls, including with disabilities, I just would like to first take as a starting point the gender equality strategy. I don't know whether people in the room are uh, aware of what the strategy is, but basically this strategy was launched in March with the idea to see how we can, uh, as European Commission, put forward concrete actions, ambitious actions, to make sure that we progress on women's rights and gender equality. And this was done uh, under three pillars. And one of the pillars was making sure that women and girls, boys and men, in all their diversity are free and free from violence. So we have a chapter in the gender equality strategy that deals with uh, the issue of combating violence. And in that chapter, it sets out a series of actions that we as the commission are going to do in this mandate to combat violence. Now, another point that is important to know about the gender equality strategy is that the motto of the strategy was, we want a Europe for women and girls, boys and men in all their diversity to lead, thrive and be free in Europe. Now, the, the important part is the very first part of that sentence, in all their diversities. And so the intersectional approach in this uh, strategy which was a new approach in what the commission was doing is important because what we're saying is that what we want to do in the commission under the mandate of Commissioner Helena Daddy is to look at how different um, aspects of people's life, women, men, and 
in all their diversities can have multiple forms of discrimination or multiple forms uh, of violence in this case. So taking those two starting points into consideration, when we look at this chapter of uh, being free, um, the issue of being free of, of violence is, is the most important by taking one of the most important tools that already exists into consideration, and that is the Istanbul Convention. For us, the Istanbul Convention on combating violence against women uh, and domestic violence is the golden standard on, uh, on this issue. And for us, it is important to make sure that we have the golden standard for all women in Europe to protect and prevent them uh, from violence. The convention sets out a whole set of uh, rules and, and, and proposals like making sure that there is 24 self seven helplines, that there is uh, assistance and support services available, such as medical, judicial, social, that there is, uh, that there are shelters, that laws are adapted to make sure that uh, all women and girls and victims of violence uh, can have access uh, to the best support uh, and protection. Now, while most of uh, EU member states are uh, supporting the Istanbul Convention, we have some uh, blocking member states and states. And while uh, there are those stumbling blocks ahead of us uh, in in ratifying the Istanbul Convention, it remains the 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 key priority for the Commission to uh, ratify the Istanbul Convention. And uh, the president of the Europe, European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has uh, several times underlined this and repeated that uh, she wants to do everything we can to, um, to assure protection of victims um, of violence and to pursue the perpetrators. And so in the gender equality strategy, that's also what we're saying, that we will do everything we can to make sure that the Istanbul Convention is ratified. However, we do recognize that if we are not able to do that, that we will look into alternative avenues. And so while uh, the court is looking into this uh, case, we have started the preparatory work for this alternative avenues. And so we uh, are launching the fitness check so that we can look at what uh, legal frameworks, what laws already exist in terms of uh, combating violence against women at national level so that we can prepare what we can, the, 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 the the things that we can improve or where the loopholes are uh, for for an e European approach. So that's one thing uh, that we can do. Now, the other thing that the Commission did recently, uh, just before the summer, is that we adopted the Victims' Rights Directive. There also, it uh, wants to make sure that all member states in the EU um, provide the best protection uh, uh, for victims but that's for all types of victims. What you also would like to know is that next year we will be setting up a network of experts uh, on violence against women and domestic violence. Now, keeping in mind that everything we do, we do from an intersectional approach and with a mainstreaming approach. So this is not just about women, it's women in all their diversities and therefore also women with disabilities. I'm sure that in the previous panel, this has already been highlighted, but for us, it was clear that the pandemic uh, had a gendered dimension from the very beginning. And thanks to the work of civil society organization, this was flagged to us. And Commissioner Daly had then also raised this issue with the member states uh, very swiftly, asking for uh, also a gender response in this uh, pandemic. And that's not only in terms of uh, making sure that women are taken on board in, in, in the policy proposals, but also recognize it, that the issue of violence against women, uh, domestic violence had significantly gone up. And now um, this is also 
the, the, the pandemic not only highlighted that issue, but also highlighted other inequalities that already existed. And women uh, with disabilities uh, facing different and difficult situations were also highlighted. So we also called member states on taking that on board. And so 16%, when we know that 16% of women in the EU are women with disabilities, or that 60% percent of the people with disabilities are women, it, it, we cannot ignore that fact and we need to take that on board in our uh, policy responses. Um, that means that we need to look uh, what it means when we talk about access to care, when we talk about what it is uh, to have access to information, uh, how we can make sure that uh, women and girls with disabilities can remain uh, dependent and that with the pandemic we saw that keeping that independence was a challenge and pushing them sometimes even into uh, the risk of domestic violence. So apart from the the Istanbul Convention that is important to combat violence against women uh, and girls and domestic violence and the um, Victims' Rights Directive, there is also the upcoming uh, disability rights strategy that we are working on, where we will also have a, a, a strong uh, angle on uh, women and girls with disabilities. And there it will be the opportunity to look at how we can increase, improve access to justice, access to information, including uh, the digital information and the digital world, uh, making sure that there is access to protection and shelter. Um, the previous speaker also mentioned the, the, the challenge of women uh, with disabilities in uh, institutions or, or residence settings and making sure that their fundamental rights are being respected. Uh, but we also need to work with care workers and assistants to see how we can help them to recognize and combat violence against women. So that's in a nutshell what we are doing, but um, as you might know, the disability rights strategy will be presented next year and at the moment there is uh, or there have been uh, consultation processes going on. I will stop here because I think I've okay. taken up my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lesia, for, for this important uh, commitment from the European Commission and uh, from the cabinet of uh, Commissioner Dali. Thank you very much for your intervention here uh, with us today. So now let's go to the Istanbul Convention, which is a clear fundamental instrument. Uh, all the speakers um, uh, mostly were talking about the importance of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, actually, we organized a CDF a webinar uh, for women and girls with disabilities in relation with the, the, this instrument, the, the Istanbul Convention in May this year, and we prepare also, thanks to the, the collaboration of the Inclusion Europe, our Autism Europe, I don't remember well, uh, a easy read uh, version, which is also available for all of you. I ask also Marine to share the link with this important instrument for our, for everyone, but also for our women and girls with disabilities. So now, uh, to address the issue on, on the importance of the Istanbul Convention, we have uh, with us Rachel apen Paul, member of the Grevio, which is the um, uh, mechanism for monitor the implementation of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, Rachel, uh, thank you very much for, for being here with us today. So you have the floor. Can you hear? Um, are you there? Yes. yes, I can. Thank you. Ah, wonderful. Rachel, thank you. Thank you. Um, you. You will be helping me with the slides. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, a very good day to everybody and hello. Uh, and thank you to the EDF and Inclusion Europe for having me here in this panel and also engaging with, uh, with the Gravio. We thank you for that. Uh, I want to go ahead with, um, with 
my presentation, like um, the, pers or the persons before me, and especially the person before me, just before me said, the Istanbul Convention is really a gold standard uh, in for uh, implementing women's rights and working against violence against women. Um, uh, in my presentation, I thought I would deal with um, the give a presentation of the convention and also its relevance to uh, women and girls with disabilities. It is, as uh, you all know, it is really truly a comprehensive tool to tackle violence against all women and girls. Um, the convention is a regional treaty and adopted within the Council of Europe. There are 34 countries who have uh, adopted the um, who have ratified it, which means that they have to implement it. They must implement the convention. You can see on the map the ones that are uh, have ratified are in blue, and the ones that have signed are in uh, red, and those that have neither signed nor ratified are in gray. Um, this the, the convention is a remarkable achievement on women's rights. Uh, it really breaks new ground. It is, uh, as a treaty, it translates women's rights into real change. Um, the convention uses uh, some terms and uh, definitions. Uh, violence against women is, um, is multifaceted and therefore um, the convention uses different terms to uh, identify and talk about violence against women. And these terms are generally understood as um, terms describing violence against women uh, by the UN also. Uh, when, when, when we talk, the convention talks about violence against women as acts of gender-based violence that result in or are likely to result in physical, sexual, psychological, and or economic harm to women. Uh, it re often refers to gender-based violence against women as violence directed against women because they are women and that affects them disproportionately. Uh, and uh, often um, when the convention refers to gen gender as such, it, uh, it is referring to the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for women and men. Um, what the article that is um, um, very relevant for the for the rights of uh, uh, women with women and girls with disabilities is the principle of non-discrimination article four of the Istanbul Convention that ensures protection of women without discrimination on the basis of their sex, gender, race, color, language, religion, political opinion, national, social origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, disability, marital status, migrant or refugee status. So this, prin this principle is the main principle that is relevant for us. Uh, regarding the, the convention itself, as, as it has been said, it is a really truly comprehensive tool and it addresses uh, four macro areas that is generally re uh, um, referred to as the four P's of the Istanbul Convention, which means that the convention takes on a four-pronged prong approach um, based on these four uh, P's that refer to the macro areas in society where um, the convention uh, requires states to intervene and to implement measures and develop policies. Um, the, the, the four P's are prevention. Uh, I'll go on. Yeah, uh, prevention is one of the P's. And it's, it's about raising awareness, running campaigns. Um, education is a very, very important aspect of uh, prevention. 
and um, education in schools, uh, every, right from childhood onwards. Um, protection services, protection measures are also an, the, the other P, the, the other pillar. Uh, it, uh, we refer to protection in, uh, in the general services, but also um, states are required to have specialized services for women victims of violence, shelters, support for victims of sexual violence, and for protection and support for child witnesses. I'm going a little fast because uh, time is short. Uh, when it comes to prosecution, um, the convention uh, requires states to criminalize a number of forms of violence that are not yet criminalized by a number of states. And when it comes to integrated policies, um, uh, states are required to allocate appropriate funding, support to NGOs and civil society. And particularly important is that states are required to have a dedicated body uh, to develop integrated policies and to implement them. Uh, now to go on to the convention and its relation relevance to women and girls with disabilities. Um, if, first of all, I want to say that Brave, Bravio, when uh, Bravio does its evaluation and visits different countries, uh, they really do make, Bravio makes a point of meeting with women, women's disability rights groups. Um, and, and Bravio often receives shadow reports and um, we, Bravio encourages uh, women's groups uh, to continue this and keep in, engage with Gravio and also use um, the evaluation reports uh, in your advocacy work. Um, re regarding the rights of women and girls with disabilities, um, the Istanbul Convention calls uh, states to, um, and calls at the attention of states the, to the need to develop integrated and gender sensitive measures. And, and the state's duty to support and appropriately fund NGOs representing women with disabilities. And data collection is also a very important aspect. Um, states are also encouraged to um, encourage companies and media to handle violence against women with disabilities and um, the victim's right to information to legal remedies and the victim's right to, be, to have access to support services sensitive to the human rights and needs of women with disabilities is a very important aspect of the convention that the convention calls for. And it also calls for, as I said earlier, sanctioning violence against women, uh, some forms of violence against women that are specifically uh, important to uh, women with disabilities, uh, sexual violence and forced sterilization. Uh, and it calls for effective response to violence against women with disabilities by law enforcement and judicial services. Uh, I, I just want to give to um, go into two countries, Serbia and um, um, Finland, not because um, they were specially bad or good, but um, just to give you some examples of what Gravio has um, identified in these two countries and how Gravio works, you get an idea. Um, in Serbia, Gravio identified a number of priority issues, among others, the need for the provision of women's support services with a gendered approach. Uh, and the Gravio found the need for an expansion of the provision of shelters in, in Serbia. And the need for heightened respect among legal guardians and medical professionals for women's informed and free decision making in relation to medical procedures such as abortion and sterilization. Um, in, uh, where in cases where women with disabilities had been raped, for example, the offense primarily used by prosecutors and law enforcement agencies was that it is an offense of sexual intercourse with a helpless person and it was not seen as rape. So this is serious. 
In Finland, um, as an, another example, uh, Gravio also identified a number of issues um, regarding preventive measures, which Article 12 of the Istanbul Convention covers. Um, um, Gravio found there was a general lack of awareness of the needs of women with disabilities. Although measures uh, seek to ensure the availability of places and shelters, disability rights groups pointed out to Gravio that the, the numbers, number of barriers that persist continued and were not being addressed. For example, there was no um, timely transport to shelters, uh, inaccessible sanitary facilities, and that many shelters were not admitting personal disability assistance. So women could not take with them their assistance. And also prevalence data point to heightened exposure to violence against women, but yet Gravio observed no particular effort in uh, addressing this by the state. Please, just one more minute. Yeah, okay. Uh, and the National Action Plan in uh, Finland did address um, the need for protection of women with disabilities, but um, it, it seemed to Gravio that the shelters and other counseling service, particularly those online, and this is uh, extremely relevant today in, in our COVID times, that these online services were not accessible to women with disabilities. Okay, so thank I you, thank I you very much. And I'm thanking um, everybody for um, allowing me to be here. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you really to for being here today with uh, EDF and um, with uh, supporting uh, women with disabilities, victims of uh, of violence. So. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight and to express our congratulations to those organizations part of the EDF uh, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in uh, other countries also, um, which are already working in the, with the Grevio, preparing, for example, a shadow report about the situation of women and girls with disabilities in their own countries when the country is going to be considered under the Istanbul Convention, which is great because it's the best way to highlight and to visible, um, to make visible the situation of women and girls with disabilities. I would like also second to take this opportunity to express my gratitude for the work uh, doing my colleagues in the uh, EDF Women's Committee. Many of them are already with us today as participants or as a speaker, which is really uh, great. And also I would like to announce that um, uh, tomorrow, proposed by the EDF Women's Committee, uh, EDF is going to launch a declaration in relation with uh, the violence against women and girls with disability due to this international day uh, for the elimination of violence against uh, women, which is also fundamental. Our last speaker today, and this is also my last intervention here because after that I have to, to leave. Um, our last intervention today in this second panel is in relation to offer some recommendations from the women's uh, movement um, uh, for, for how to address and to end violence against women and girls with disabilities. And in this case, we have with us Claire Fursan, a policy and campaigning director of the European Women's Lobby, a European platform where uh, EDF is also part of. So uh, Claire, uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. So I pass you the floor to, to hear from you. And also I pass the floor, I pass the, the coordination of the this panel to Marine because I have to leave. I'm so sorry about that. Congratulations, Marine, and all the participants for this wonderful initiative. So uh, Claire, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Anna. Uh, thank you very much for giving the floor to, to me. I'm Claire Fossons, Policy and Campaigns Director at the Open Women's Lobby. 
Um, so I'd like to share uh, my presentation, if you would allow for a, a few minutes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm I'm representative here of the Open Women's Lobby. The Open Women's Lobby is the largest umbrella organization of women's organization in Europe, uh, with more than 2,000 women's organization in new countries uh, and accessing countries, but also uh, counting uh, European coordination like uh, the European Disability Forum. So um, I'm really pleased to to be here uh, in. To participate to this uh, to this webinar, thanks very much again. So I'd like to present the recommendations from from the women's movement. Uh, the Open Women's Lobby is fighting for uh, a feminist Europe since 30 years now, and we have a particular important focus, obviously, on the fight against violence against women and girls. Um, I'd like to specify the, the, the framework in, in which we work, uh, which is that we, uh, we would like to underline the, the continuum of violence. So um, violence is a systemic issue that affects women all over Europe, and unfortunately that knows no, no borders, no social uh, limitations, et cetera, et cetera. So all women in, in Europe and, and beyond are affected by, by violence. And this uh, long-term systemic issue, violence uh, is, is actually uh, infringing upon the rights of women to live a life free, um, as was already um, underlined by pre pre previous speakers. Uh, so this is a violence that existed obviously be before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, breaks through. Um, but it has got uh, worsened with, uh, with, the, with the private crisis, unfortunately. And we know that women with, the, with disabilities, it has been clearly and brilliantly said uh, previously by, by predecessor, are particularly exposed uh, to violence and uh, in particular to some specific forms of violence like sexual violence, domestic violence, forced sterilization and, and forced abortion. Um, so it's it's crucial to really tackle the issue and also to take into account the particular uh, situation of women with disabilities if we want to really ensure all women in Europe are protected. So unfortunately, the situation wor worsened under COVID-19 uh, because there was an enabling environment for perpetrators and it was much more difficult for, for women to, to get uh, assistance, to seek assistance. Um, lots of fair services were um, not really accessible. Uh, we saw drop in funding. So really a, a very um, um, worrying situation during the first lockdown and, and probably continuing right now. So we, we have been calling for new commitments um, from member states of the EU, but also from the European institution um, to tackle the phenomenon, to tackle the increase, but also to implement that within a long-term vision. Um, so we have been calling on, on, on all member states to declare all the services to protect women, victims of violence uh, essential, uh, meaning that they should keep being open, that they should be staffed properly and that they should be funded properly. And also we've been calling on, on, on those countries to ensure accessibility of women with disabilities, in particular to helplines, support services and to the judicial system. Um, also recalling here like the, the, the intervention of, of, uh, of the colleague from Gravio where really it was underlined how important that is to have specific access uh, for women with disabilities. Also, we have been calling on all responses to COVID-19 to have a, a, a woman's perspective, not only as um, Lesia Radeliki was saying before, having uh, making sure that women are part of the decision-making process. So that's already a first step that is really important, um, but also making sure that there a specific situation. We know that women have been particularly in situation of care during the crisis and uh, unfortunately this is often undervalued. So that needs to be corrected. And we have been also calling on um, all the member states and mobilizing our uh, membership to ensure that uh, women's organization are systematically concerted to answer to the crisis. 
So really now more than ever, what we, what we need, what is absolutely necessary is to have a EU coordinated action to end violence against women and girls. Uh, we need the EU to act in a united way to protect all of those women, all of those girls everywhere in Europe, wherever they are, and to end all forms of male violence. So this means uh, accelerating the conclusion of the EU accession to the Istanbul Convention. And uh, needless to, to explain now how important the Istanbul Convention is. Um, the, our colleague from Gravio really explained really well how important the provisions of the Convention are to protect a woman from uh, violence, from the fear of it, to prevent those violence, to ensure they have access to justice, and also to have an enabling environment through uh, the right policies. So it's necessary really that the EU access to this convention, that all EU countries access to this convention and that it is implemented properly and consistently everywhere in Europe at all times, also in crisis time like the ones we are living in. As uh, Lesia was saying earlier, we also believe that the necessity to uh, go for alternative routes and actually uh, we are calling on the EU to really take this alternative route ASAP uh, we know that unfortunately the convention, the ratification of the convention at the EU level is blocked. So we are calling on uh, the European Commission to um, propose a legislation that would really take on board the standards of the European, of the Istanbul Convention, sorry, um, to include violence against women and girls, all of all forms of violence against women and girls, also those that are affecting in particular women with disabilities to countermand EU crimes. Um, so this would give like clearly a basis for the EU to act upon in a concerted way against this uh, widespread uh, violation of women's rights. Um, that would allow the EU to adopt a directive, so really a legislation that would prevent and combat all forms of violence against women and girls. And of course, this uh, directive, this legislation should have specific um, provisions to ensure the protection and the accessibility uh, of women with disabilities. This needs to go with adequate funding uh, for those following development uh, at the EU level right now. You know that there's discussions on the next long-term budget of the EU. Uh, the latest development has been positive in terms of increase in uh, funding to uh, fight um, for equality between women and men. We are really calling for this uh, ex extra funding increased funding to ensure that uh, grassroots organizations and women's organizations in general can really fight um, uh, the, the welcome women, but also uh, fight the pervasive, this pervasive violation of, of women's rights. So uh, I'd like to, to conclude and thank you for your attention. Um, as was said, tomorrow is the International Day for the Elimination of All Violence Against Women and Girls. We are entering what we call the 16 Days of Activism. Uh, against violence against women and girls, and we are, we are really mobilizing, and we call on you all here around to mobilize, to uh, raise awareness on this uh, widespread violation of, of women's rights, and uh, we thank you very much. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire, and to all speakers for providing your, your views and ideas on what action um, the EU and European countries can take to fight violence against women and girls with disabilities. Um, so I'm taking over now from, from Anna. We have some time for questions. Uh, we already received a few questions for all speakers. Unfortunately, um, the member from the cabinet of Commission Dali had to leave. So if I'm correct, Lesia is already gone. Uh, yeah, I don't see her anymore. So we'll see um, who can take those those questions. The first question is from Louisa. Louisa, if you want to take the floor early to ask your question. Yes, I. I we, we can hear can you, you, Louisa. Hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. But uh, uh, it, it, I am very sad that uh, the uh, member of the cabinet of uh, Commissioner Dali uh, leave uh, uh, the, 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 
the, the, the, the conference because my question is for her. And the question was, how can the gender strategy influence compliance with the strategy itself in the same member? And how we can use the gender strategy to force our government to respect the rights of women with disability to be free from all violence? Uh, if uh, there is uh, someone can <coughs> answer to me. <laughs> Not a, 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 a good uh, experience on this uh, attendee of the Mrs. Uh, I don't remember the name. Thank you, thank you, Louisa. So maybe, Claire, if you can maybe take this question because the European Women's Lobby is also working on, on the implementation and advocating for implementation of the gender uh, equality strategy. Uh, sure, I'm not sure I got all of the questions. I couldn't hear really well. Um, so indeed, we have been working on the gender equality strategy that has been launched by the European Commission in, in March. We have been working when they were you know, in influencing it, when they were uh, um, drafting it. And after that, we have been working also to make sure uh, that the European Parliament and the member states um, not only take on board the gender equality strategy, but also take a step further because it's an amazing tool. Um, it's been, it has been long since uh, we didn't see a proper political strategy at the EU level uh, on equality between women and men with strong commitments on violence against women and girls. So we, we've been very pleased with, with the content of the strategy, but there are of course areas where we would see uh, progress, we would see improvements. Um, so, on, on, in terms of, of application implementation, obviously we are calling on the European Commission to uh, start implementing other commitments. So, there's already a roadmap and on violence against women and girls. Uh, we have heard lately that by the end of 2021, there will be a proposal um, in terms of legislation to combat some forms of violence against women and girls. So, as I said, uh, our call is really to have a comprehensive legislation to tackle all forms of violence against women and girls, not only some of them. Um, we believe this, this phenomenon is really um, infringing upon the value of the EU and that the EU has a, has a common interest in fighting it uh, all together. Um, and also, obviously, we have been through our members pushing for different member states to, to adopt the strategy or to adopt uh, the, the different strategy and to go a step further. Um, so hopefully that will we have, um, this strategy will have some reach also at the national level. Hopefully that's uh, answering your question. Thank you, Claire. Uh, actually, I was just informed that Lesia is still here. So, Lesia, if you want to to reply to this to this question as well, and another question that we also received for you is because you mentioned that in the ZBT right strategy there will be some aspect on uh, access to justice. Um, so the question is, what is the current plan for that, and how can NGO uh, and also individual contribute to the strategy? So, Lesia, if you still with us, um, you can unmute yourself. Sorry. I apologize for this being a bit messy, but as I as I was about to leave, I saw questions coming in, so I, I'm trying to answer them quickly before leaving. Um, so, on on how we can make sure that member states are on board. Uh, on the gender equality strategy and on making uh, sure that, you know, uh, we're combating violence against women. Now, the gender equality strategy is what the commission will be doing for the next five years. It's a set of questions, a uh, set of actions, sorry. And these actions we will be rolling out bit by bit as uh, Claire from the European Women's Lobby just said. And so there we will need to have the member states on board if we want this to work. I mean, the gender equality strategy is not just something that we only uh, are the owners of it's something and it's a commitment that we all uh, have to to adhere to so that's that's one thing on on the issue of women with disabilities as I mentioned there is the upcoming uh, disabilities rights strategy um, and there uh, 
again, this is something that we will be uh, presenting next year. And this is something that is not just uh, committing the commission to do things, but there will be a set of actions to also work with member states or society organizations, European Parliament and so forth to, to uh, progress uh, or move forward on, on those issues. Um, in terms of how to contribute to the strategy, as I said, there has been a series of um, consultations and I think that EDF has been part of that. Uh, but if there are any other um, inputs that you would like to share with us, please feel free to uh, forward them to uh, the secretariat of the EDF and uh, so that we can receive them uh, and, and take them on board. In terms of what exactly will be in the strategy, I've just mentioned a couple of points that we will need to keep in mind when drafting the strategy, as in what will be in there that uh, is difficult for me to say at the moment because the consultation process is still happening, as I said. And uh, my colleague, uh, Nora, is, is actually the one leading on this file. And she will be maybe uh, more, more, uh, more ready to, to answer those questions. So I hope that I have replied quickly to, to the questions. Um, but otherwise, feel free to also send them via email. And I will try to get back to you. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Alessia. Thank you so much for being with us and also staying longer because I knew that uh, that you had to leave by 12. So we really appreciate uh, your, your participation. Um, so uh, next question that we have is from Mohamed. Uh, in relation to violence in psychiatry. So I don't know, Mohamed, if you want to take the floor, I can uh, unmute you so you can ask your question or make your comment. Okay, we cannot hear you, Mohammed. So I will read uh, what you sent and then redirect the question to the speakers. So in relation to uh, violence in psychiatry, uh, it was a, a general question on why all complaints on uh, manslaughter or mistreatment committed against women and mothers under psychiatric restraint are dis dismissed, in, especially in France. And how come all convention, including the UN Convention on the Right of Person with Diabetes and the Istanbul Convention are still being uh, ignored by, by states? Uh, and then there was also uh, a general comment more on the fact that there are like many or like several cases of women uh, being still abused in, in psychiatry and why is it still taboo? Why is this the, the stereotype around it? So I would like maybe to, to ask uh, Yult here if you could also mention in the research that has been done, um, what was your experience talking to women um, use, like using psychiatry treatment and how information was collected? And then I will ask Rachel from Gravio to also uh, provide some comments on what can be done um, when country really ignore the, the, the convention or any advice on that. So first, uh, yield you. Great, well, thank you for the question. Um, in my experience during the research, talking to uh, people who had been through uh, the institutions, uh, quite a few of the women had also been in psychiatric units. And to be honest, um, the worst cases of violence that I heard um, took place in psychiatric un units. And then by that, I mean the most traumatizing forms of care. Um, and because this is, this is a form of care, it is seen by society as doing the right thing because we are caring for that person. And obviously horrible, horrible things happen in that context. And I think there was a lot of women, uh, there are a lot of women in the Netherlands and I think in a lot of other countries as well, who have been labeled as having a psychiatric disorder, um, maybe not have been recognized as uh, having an intellectual disability and needing different support. And uh, one woman in particular who often does the presentations with me, she tells about her story about being stuck indoors in a psychiatric unit, unit for 16 years, not being able to get out. And um, um, 
you know, there's a, it's just, there's a lot of horrible things happening. And I think by her t telling this story to professionals, that's the only way I think that we can really start seeing a shift in, in thinking where, you know, we can start shifting from, but this is what we do to help people to, oh, okay, so what we are doing is actually really harmful to people as well. And the specific, I, I don't know the specific example that you're mentioning um, of, of the woman uh, that was killed. Um, unfortunately that happens and unfortunately people don't have the status in society to get the attention that that deserves. Um, so I, I don't really have an answer, I'm afraid, in terms of what to do about it, other than talk about it and letting um, people who have been through that experience talk about it, giving them a platform. I think that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yeltia. Now I'm going to give the floor to, to Rachel. Rachel, we also had another question on the Istanbul Convention on... Um, how to combat the dangerous narrative coming from specific government in Europe uh, against women rights and really um, do you think the EU has a role in ensuring that all EU, EU member states uh, ratify the, the Istanbul Convention? I know that this question is a bit political so you can also just reply to, to the first part if you wish. Um, Rachel. Yeah. I can first deal with the second question. Um, you're very right. Um, I, it, it is up to the EU to thrash this out. And it is a um, topic that is being discussed in the EU. And it's up to the EU to uh, finally decide whether they want to ratify the convention or not. Um, but um, the Council of Europe and um, Gra Gravio, I'm, I'm speaking here on behalf of Gravio, and Gravio is a monitoring body. So uh, what we do is conduct evaluation reports. And uh, like I said earlier on, it's very important that, um, um, and especially NGOs, in this uh, very, in this wind that is hitting all of us where, uh, there is a lot of, um, uh, how shall I put it, uh, resistance. There is, I, I can't say a lot of resistance, but we all know that there is resistance to uh, women's, uh, to, the, um, to, the, to us achieving women's rights. And there is, a, there is, and therefore, in my opinion, there is a resistance also, for example, to the Istanbul Convention, which is really, um, um, a unique tool um, re um, for the protection of women's rights, including women and girls with disabilities. So uh, it's um, in this uh, in this wind that is attacking us. Um, I, what I think we should do is not give up. Um, and it, NGOs and women's rights uh, groups really have a very important role. But uh, I, I also understand that it's very difficult to work as NGOs in, in a climate where there is such strong resistance to women's engagement and women's engagement for their own rights. So it is, it is difficult, but we have to stand together and move forward. Um, what the Gravio does, in general, what I also want to say is that all the countries that we have um, visited and engaged with have uh, responded more or less positively to us. They do make space for us. They, they engage with us and we, and the Gravio engages with them in a dialogue. So um, we, we just have to wait and see because it is a long process and it is Gravio's work is, um, is a process of dialogue with the states involved. So I still believe that it does make a difference uh, in order to engage with states because in the end, it is states that are accountable for, um, for women to achieve their rights. I, I, I feel that's what I want to say at this point. Thank you. 
Oops. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. I was uh, uh, talking without my mic being uh, <laughs> being on. Uh, so thank you very much for for your reply. We still have one or two minutes for a last question. So I'll ask uh, Magda if you want to ask your question uh, orally. That is more on the role of uh, NGO and civil society. And Claire, if uh, you can reply to her question. So Magda, if you want to ask your question. Hello, everybody. I don't know if you, if you can hear me now. Yes, we hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so my question is uh, that um, it seems that uh, over the years, uh, various NGOs and collectives have uh, accumulated a lot of, you know, still relevant know-how about the situation of girls and women with disabilities, as well as uh, many important recommendations have been form formulated by them. Uh, and how to achieve uh, tangible changes in member states and also on the e EU level. And my question is, is there an initiative or a movement uh, that, uh, you know, um, makes uh, use of uh, all that work and that builds on that uh, in order for us to move forward <laughs> more quickly with concrete policy and political advocacy? Because we are all aware uh, that, you know, institutional monitoring takes time. And it makes sense, but you know the, the, the clock is ticking, and there is a lot of know-how uh, that we already have. Uh, so how can we uh, actually already make use of it to to bring tangible changes to to people's lives as they're happening uh, at the moment? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Magda. If uh, Claire, if you want to to reply to that question. Yes, yeah, thanks very much, Magda. This, this is a, a, an amazing question and the question I'm asking myself every day, actually. Uh, so yes, uh, that, that's uh, the, the, the meaning, the, the sense of, of our work. We want to make sure that uh, the advocacy and the monitoring we do at the EU level in the case of uh, the Open Women's Lobby um, uh, Secretariat is having an impact on women's life. So. Uh, it, the, the process at the EU level is very long. It takes it takes a lot long, very long time to um, create legislation, and also the, the hurdles are unfortunately numerous to have all member states to align there uh, behind a, a position and, and policies. So this is sometimes um, it could be discouraging. But I think, as as Rachel was saying, I think it links up very well with with the previous question. Actually, uh, if we keep being um, in solidarity and acting together, I think we will see change happening. Um, the women's movement is, is active since decades now, and we have seen progress. So maybe it doesn't go as fast as we do, but we did. Um, at the European Women's Lobby, we have the, we are lucky to have members and numerous members uh, all over Europe. So we try to um, exchange ideas, exchange practices, know-how, as you said, uh, in, a, in order to be uh, more effective. And on the Istanbul Convention, again, to link up with the previous question, uh, we have members working together uh, within uh, the a group of experts called the Observatory on Violence Against Women and Girls, which exists in 30 years. And this group of experts really exchange best, pra best practices, know-how, and campaign together to uh, have uh, to move the needle in at the national level, but also support our work at the EU level. It's, it's an interaction. And, and uh, I, I imagine that Lesia from um, Commission of Daddy Cabinet just left, but we are also in, in, in contact, in direct contact with EU Commissioner. Back in July, we had a, a, a working session with Commissioner Daly and our members from the countries uh, of the EU that haven't ratified the Istanbul Convention. So this is really about building up a movement, uh, being in solidarity and indeed exchanging ideas. We can do that within the European Women's Lobby because we have the structure, uh, but I think moments like this one are actually um, really key to, to build up this, uh, this movement. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And thank you to all the speakers of the second panel. So now it's time to, to conclude and to end uh, uh, this event. So in this webinar, we heard about the various forms of violence faced by women and girls with disabilities. And we saw that some, type of, some types of violence are those faced by other group of women. 
so like domestic violence, uh, sexual harassment, but there are also other parts of violence that are more specific to women and girls with disability that also need to be addressed. So we heard about forced sterilization, forced, forced contraception. We also heard about violence in institution and violence in psychiatry. And unfortunately, we see that in many countries, those type of violence are still recognized as legal. Um, they're authorized by law. And there's still a lot of work to be done to eradicate um, all those abuse and violation faced by women and girls with disabilities. In addition to violence, we also need to address the structural discrimination and sexism and the patriarchy that still exists in all European uh, societies. So we also heard about stereotypes, about the notion of consent, the fact that, uh, especially for women with intellectual disability, women with psychosocial disabilities, it's really hard to report violence and to be trusted by the justice system. There are also other barriers faced by women and girls with disabilities, such as inaccessibility. Um, we'll share with you the presentation from, from speakers, but also from Claire de Stant, who addressed specifically a form of violence, a uh, form of barriers uh, in reporting uh, to the justice system. And that's something that, that we also really need to address. So how to do that? Uh, uh, more specifically, what can we do both at the European level and national level to, to address violence? Uh, so from what we heard from the dis different speakers uh, in the second panel, um, we really need to work at all levels. Uh, so it's come from people working in institution, care, grassroots movements, um, and also policymakers and lawmakers at national and, and European level. But it also really starts with working with women and girls with disabilities, not only listening to them, but involving them on uh, measures that need to be adopted. Because it's only by listening to women with disabilities, by listening to victims of violence, that we can really address uh, those issues that are uh, deeply enshrined in, in society. Uh, at European level, so we heard about the need to advocate for the ratification of the Istanbul Convention and also the need to work with Gravio on the implementation of, uh, of the, the, the convention. Uh, you will see in the chat uh, all the links on the convention, but also a webinar that explains to you how you can report uh, to the convention. Uh, to the to the Gravio committee, to the group of experts. And tomorrow, uh, EDF will also launch a specific pages on the Istanbul Convention with all the information about the convention itself, about the reporting process. Uh, so you can check the, the website of EDF tomorrow. Um, we also need to take into account the various strategies that have been adopted by the European Union and that will be adopted. So for our organization, it's really important to work on the implementation of the gender equality strategy that was presented by the commission, but also to work on other important strategies such as the victim rights strategy that was also already adopted and strategy that will be adopted. So the disability rights strategy to be adopted next year and the child rights strategy that will also have uh, specific information on girls and hopefully on girls with disability as well. Um, we receive a few questions on what's the role in the EU um, outside of Europe. So on that question, I also wanted to mention that tomorrow the EU will launch its gender action plan that relates to gender equality in foreign policy and outside of the EU. So we will see there how women and girls with disability have been uh, included or not, and what are the plans for, for the EU on that. So I also advise you to check that, that document. So when we say we need to work on that, we need to work on holding, um, keeping the EU and national government accountable. When you look at the strategy, you will see that there are also specific recommendations for member states. So you can also use it in your advocacy at national level. 
We can also advocate for specific legislation. So we heard from Claire about um, alternative to the Istanbul Convention. So for instance, the EU directive on preventing and combating all form of violence. Um, which is a really, really uh, important initiative. And we also heard from um, Isabel uh, from Spain on what has been done to, to prohibit uh, for sterilization uh, of women and girls with disabilities. So that's example of um, legislative initiative that, that can be taken. Um, so as I mentioned, so tomorrow is the International Day on eliminating uh, all form of violence against women and girls. Um, you will find more information on that on EDF website tomorrow. Um, I also wanted to advertise another webinar that will be organized by the European Union of the Deaf on supporting deaf women victim of domestic violence. So we'll post um, the link to, to register in the chat box if you're interested to, to attend that event. Um, and we really want to thank all of you, all the participants for attending, for, for your really good question, for participating actively also during the q and I really want to thank all the, the wonderful speakers that we had uh, today for sharing their expertise. Um, also, thank you to, to Raquel and to Ifa uh, for your support during the event. Thank you for, to Hélène from Inclusion Europe for also helping us and uh, a lot of uh, uh, many thanks to the to the captioner Kimberly for your great work and to our two interpreter um, uh, for um, for the interpretation and on this we'll so close the webinar uh, don't be don't hesitate to to be in touch with EDF my email address is also in the chat box and we'll be happy to continue the the conversation with with all of you have a great day and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.